the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. I am tired of seeing my light go dim. I am tired of seeing my light go out. Lord, give me oil, fresh oil tonight, fresh oil tonight, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil, fresh oil tonight. Dosa la tata para cabo tele mandela cabela tole pariate is capo popo 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 that's why darkness can overpower you. You don't have enough light. You can't have light if you don't have oil. La parate kaboja. Shakata kata kata te pa 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 ya ita pa 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 pa. This is why John was described as a burning and a shining light. He did not just shine; he burned. Takabate ita pa 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 ya ita pa 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 pa. Le kwate le kabilanto le kata kata te braska pola pe atwadi shakata pata 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 pata. I wish you will pray a little more, just a little more. I wish you will push beyond the limitations of your flesh and strike something in the spirit tonight. Lama namada kapala katele prakade la potele patele patela twa shata ta 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 ta. May your oil not run down in the day of your visitation. Akapaya ete te te parata pota kabila kataya eta ba 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 ba. The Bible says they had not enough oil. Akapaya etwa twa tele mando la kabila daya ika pe kabula kaminando le. Brasis apara e kapali kapote le kabila kwada la kabila tuda la mana 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 kapote le pariato badio la pa 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 give me oh Lord ishaba la tua apele tu palia e kapola kabila tata pada tua what is a priest without oil? What is a priest without oil? What is a priest without oil? E kapela tua tua tua. I katala katel, I kapole padu tabia, ende kade kade ludra vina, la kabote le baliado, le kade 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 parusa, I shata tata lino, la kada kade kado. Lord, I don't want to faint. Lord, I don't want to falter. Lord, I don't want to be feeble. Lord, I don't want to fail. I kwata la papo papi pa. I don't. I don't want to fall. Give us oil. Give us oil. There is so much you want to do with our lives. There is so much you want to establish by our hands. There is so much you want to do by our obedience. But many lack oil. Many lack oil. Many lack oil. Their lamps are no longer burning. Their lights are no longer shining. Shada da barato, ika bala kabela to la brigada, anda tati pula kwate le kudi, ede pa 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 pa, ika bola kabote le kabia. Give me oil, give me oil, give me oil. Daddy, the journey is far. Daddy, the journey is far. There are still more lands to conquer. But I find that my lamp is dim, my light is out, my oil is finished. 
I know why you are not praying. You think that the Christian life is a joke. Oh my God, Ali Porasana. Pray a little more. Allah boko preke dele bo po po paru asika. Emba la guada la kaba da bo do lo bo ko do lo bo. Ora kaba tua dale bo ko seke dele bo ko zola man tua. Iba raga do se kabila kwate le kabila ntaya. Pray for yourself. I'm not saying pray for me. Pray for yourself. Oil, 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 oil. That I may continue to burn. That I may continue to burn. That I may continue to burn. Ula ba 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 ba. Ika bola maro kopre sana mando le kabila nando shada tapila. You will not wait to hear that the bridegroom comment only to find out that your lamp is dry. That your lamp is dry. That your lamp is dry. Ola manda mana ma kwadele. Use parata kabila no kurvisa talios. Isha para kabilando telebatwa. Ika bolo kobolo kruvesa talabatola. Jelo kriva nanto skibalati. E pa 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 pa. E kwado le kruba tolo bregedeo. Ikalora bara kadele kabula bara taya. Oh Jesus. Oh Jesus. Give us oil. Give us oil. Give us oil. Give us oil. That our lights will never be dim. Oil. 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 Sweet Jesus. Oh, man, tell the Boroko Sina by Oil Jesus. Oil Jesus. Ada Boroko does it a man to shut up. Eke Bola Mada do Breshaka Tire. In Jesus. Name we have prayed. Sweet Holy Spirit tonight.
please yet again show us great mercy. Oh God, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you open up the riches of your bounties and anoint us with fresh oil. And let there be such great supply that everyone that lives here tonight will be quickened with might. On site, online. That by your benevolence tonight, Holy Spirit, we receive grace upon grace to be your instruments in these last days. Take all the glory, Holy Ghost. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise God. Uh, today is the sixth installment of our deliberate commitment to school ourselves according to the dictates of scripture in the way of priesthood. Priesthood. If you were here since we began this teaching, by now you should understand that the call of God unto salvation is a call for every believer to function within the dynamics of priesthood. So I have taught you in these teachings that as a Christian, you are not fulfilling your design. If you have not committed yourself to a life of perpetual priesthood, if God is going to get profit from your life, if the kingdom of God is going to advance on your account, if the will, the plans, and the purposes of God are going to find expression in the earth, it must be that there are people, Christians, who have committed themselves to a life of priesthood. I have said to you that in the visible realm, the war that is fought the unseen war that is fought is actually a war of priesthood. So those in the negative supernatural are engaging in priesthood activities. Those of us in the positive supernatural must also engage in priesthood activities. The idea of the system or the body of architecture that we define as priesthood, the idea behind it is that there is a spirit that is trying to invade the visible realm. There is a spirit that is seeking government over man. And if that spirit is going to find expression in the visible realm, there must be priests in that territory that will give that spirit license. So there is a spirit of wickedness, there is a spirit of oppression, there is a spirit that is ruled by Satan that is seeking such expression, such visibility. And what happens is that those in the negative supernatural build their priesthood infrastructure to give dominion, to give government, to give influence and visibility to that spirit that is governed by Satan. It is the same thing on the other side. God himself is looking for occasion and opportunity to burst into our realm. But the only way he's going to be able to do that is that we too must align ourselves with the disciplines of priesthood. And I've said to you that priesthood is not just prayer. Priesthood is the body of architecture that covers basically certain dimensions that must exist for God to become visible in the affairs of men. So in the priesthood, priesthood architecture, you have the priest, you have the altar, you have the temple, you have the sacrifice. These are the four items that make up the priesthood. So when we are speaking about priesthood, we are not just speaking about prayer and praying. We are speaking about the system in which prayer and praying is carried out. So prayer and praying are part of the activities that are associated with priesthood architecture. So 
we have tried to establish that if you are going to be effective in priesthood, you must understand the various roles that these specific items play in the priesthood. So you must understand the role of the priest, you must understand the role of the altar, you must understand the role of sacrifice, and you must understand the role of the temple. If you don't understand how these things function and how they are related, it will be difficult for you to engage in priesthood. Remember that the Bible says that when they were to build the tabernacle, what we like to call the tabernacle of Moses in the wilderness, the tabernacle of Moses was a mobile structure. They could build it up and then dismantle it anytime. The driver for the building of that tabernacle was that God said to Moses, he said, tell the people to build me a house that I may dwell amongst them. So the whole idea was to create a dwelling place for an invisible God. A dwelling place for an invisible God. It was an, an uh, enterprise to trap an invisible reality. So everything I'm saying to you, I'm not saying out of my mind just to sound deep or to sound uh, mystical. When I say that priesthood is to give visibility to a spirit. It is by the tabernacle that God was able to come and dwell amongst his people. So whenever they saw the tabernacle, they knew that that was where you will meet with God. His reality existed. His reality was manifested in the tabernacle. So if you press a little deeper, you will now find out that if you want to describe the matters of priesthood clearly, you will be able to describe it with one word. Priesthood is basically about influence. That's what priesthood is. Influence. The kingdom of darkness is seeking influence over men. The kingdom of God is seeking influence over men. And the tool by which you are going to be able to establish that influence is priesthood. And just like we've been praying since we started from Sister Anna to Brother Peculiar, you will find that in scriptures, the Bible says that ye are the light of the world. The light of the world. And the thing that gives light is that light does not burn on its own. For there to be light, there must be oil. I'm saying this so that you understand that sometimes when we gather here to pray, don't pray prayers without understanding the import and the weight of the things that you are engaging with God in prayer. For instance, when we are praying, Lord, give me oil, give me oil, you are asking the Lord to provide you the resources that will allow you to continue to function in your requirement as a priest to provide influence. If we are going to influence darkness, then we must be light. If we are going to influence wickedness, then we must be righteousness. If we are going to influence um, hatred, then we must be love. If we are going to ex influence anything in the visible realm, then we must mirror the direct image of God that is the direct opposite of what it is that Satan is establishing on the face of the earth. And some of us don't know that it is even possible for your light to be put out. It's possible for you to be living and yet you are not making any visible impact on the visible realm. And yet you are alive and you bear the title of the Christian. Your light is not even shining. Because have you read the scripture before? The Bible says no man lighted a candle and puts it where? Under a bush. So if you are the candle of the Lord and you have been lit, lit and you are under a bushel, then it means that there is something wrong with your light. Because if God is the one that lit you, God, Jesus was the one saying that no man lighted a candle. Have you read that in Matthew 5 before? He says no man. He's using man as a metaphor to describe a spiritual reality that he's trying to communicate. Because Jesus was trying to communicate a spiritual reality. He began by saying, ye are the light of the world. Ye, no man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel. Meaning that if you are the light of the world, you have been lit by God. Now, if it is God that lit you, just as no man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel, 
if God lit you and you are invisible, the problem is not with the lighter. The problem is with the one that has been lit. Because no man lights a candle. Do you light a candle in your house and then go and hide it? He says he puts it on a candlestick so that he can give light to everybody in the room. So if your light is not bringing influence to everybody in your family, everybody on your street, everybody in your territory, everybody where you work, and God is deliberately hiding your light, it means he does not trust your light. There's something wrong with what you call light. It might look like light to you, but God has not begun to see that what you bear is actually light. Because no man lights a candle and hides it. If the fires that are raging upon your heart, the fires that are burning upon your life, have actually been lit by the Lord. If you are a priest of the Most High, then your influence should be tangible, should be visible. Because to bear the Lord's light is a place of trust. It's a place of trust. It's supposed to be visible. You are supposed to be giving light to everybody in the room. But many times Christians don't even know that all they have left is just a tie to. You are still bearing the name of Christian, but you are no longer burning. You are no longer shining. As I stepped on the altar, the Lord began to remind me of a scripture. That's the scripture I was trying to find just now. Let me show you something. Give me 2 Samuel 17, begin at verse 15. Brother Peculiar has thrown me off course, but let me, and Anna, they've thrown me off course, but let me find something. 2 Samuel 17, 15. Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abata the priest, First and so Ahithophel advised Absalom, Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus I have so advised. This is where I'm looking for. Go to 16. 16. Now, therefore, go to 21. I'm looking for something. Let me be sure I'm in the right place. Ah, no, that's not what I'm looking for. Let me find it. Second Samuel 21, that's what I'm looking for. 21, verse 15. 2 Samuel 21 and verse 15. When the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines. And what happened to David? David grew what? Faint. Next verse. Then Ish be Benob, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was 300 shekels, Who's bearing a new, who was bearing a new sword, thought he could what? Kill David. Next verse. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you what? So who was David? David was the lamp the light of Israel. David was the light of Israel. His light was what the, 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 the men in battle recognized as the distinctive factor over Israel. And it, it, to them, it would have been an abomination for David to have died in battle. But the Bible says in verse 16 that as David was fighting he became faint. It's possible to be fainting. And I'm using this as a metaphor to establish to you that if you don't have enough oil, it's possible that you could be the light of your family and that light can be put out. Because you are fainting. You have lost oil. The Bible says when he went down, he fought against the Philistines, he grew faint. And the thing about this thing is that as he grew faint, the enemy noticed that David was no longer as strong as he was. And the Bible says the son of the giant, he saw it and he said he thought, he thought in his heart. What the Bible is saying is that when he looked at David, he said this man has become faint, he has become weak. So he was thinking in his heart that this is an opportunity to kill him. 
Satan does not strike you when you feel that you are strong enough. Satan will always come for you in your weakest moments. Weakest moments. He said he thought he could kill him. But thank God that one of David's fighters saw what was happening. He came to his aid, struck the Philistine and did what? Killed him. And he said to David, you not go follow us, go fight again. Lest the lamp of Israel be put out. When you are faint, it's not the time to go to battle. And this is why you must make sure that you have extra oil. I'm just trying to explain to us why it's important we pray the kind of prayers we pray. This is why you must have extra oil. And this is part of the reason we engage in priesthood. Your continuous engagement in prayer, you are preparing yourself for the day of trouble. The Bible says that if the cloud be full of rain, it will empty itself over the earth. Prayers are spiritual things that cannot be lost. Prayers are never wasted. Every time you engage in praying, even if you do not see instant reward, the enterprise of prayer itself is not a waste of time. Prayer is storable entity, like I was showing you next last week. It's storable, it's storable, it can be stored. That's why the angel came to Cornelius and said, Your prayers have come up to heaven as a memorial. So it means that every time Cornelius was praying, it was being stored. A storable entity. So it means therefore that if you are not praying at all, it means you have nothing in your storage. There is nothing in your incense. What a way to be living. That is why in the day of battle, Satan now begins to identify you as the weak link. They saw that. How come that the giant, look at the way the Bible describes him, that even only his, was he his spear or his shield now? His spear. Do you know how heavy that is? 300 shekels in weight. That giant looked at all the other people and saw that those guys were not guys to mess with. Those guys had oil. They were burning. They were shining. Well, looked at David and said, this man has become faint and thought in his heart, this is a good time to kill him. But thank God, one of the warriors noticed it and came to his aid, fought off the giant and told him, Oga, you have become faint. You will not come with us to battle again. Lest the lamp of Israel be put out. You see, me, 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 my body, as I was listening to those prayers coming from the office, my body is this. What if your light has already been put out? Can that be the reason you are trying to do spiritual warfare over your family and then you are receiving such feedbacks that it is every time you pray for your family, you will be sick for 14 days? Every time you attempt to engage in spiritual activities, and confront demonic strong, strong men regarding your destiny, that is the period that certain strange things will begin to happen. Because the devil knows that you are too weak to command that level of authority in priesthood. You are faint. You don't have enough oil. Your lamp has already gone out. Has already gone out. And this, this, this coalesces into the thing I, want to talk, I wanted to talk about tonight. Because like I told you, this week I want to begin to talk about priest tools for priesthood. And if you are going to look at the tools for priesthood, we must look at it in the four elements. What are the tools for the priest himself? For the priest himself. If the priest is going to function accurately, his number one uh, posture in the spirit is a posture of consecration. What are the tools that he needs to be able to be consecrated unto God? Otherwise, he will go into battle because like I told you, it's a war of priesthood. He will go into battle and he will be badly bruised by the enemy. He doesn't have enough oil. He doesn't have enough strength to engage at the level he's determining to, he's, he's attempting to engage in. 
God. You see, every time I read this scripture, I always thank God that there was somebody looking out for the king. You know, one of the, the worst places to be, especially as a pastor, is to be in a place where your members don't love you enough to pray for you. It's a terrible place to be in as a preacher. I remember years ago, years ago, years ago, when I first read the story about Fini and Fadanash, first time I saw that story years ago, about Fini and Fadanash, I made it a point of duty day in, day out for almost, let me, so that in case I don't remember, between three to five years, every day I used to beg God, just send me two men that will love me enough to pray for me. David's saving grace, saving grace was that a man was looking out for the king and said, ah, this guy will kill, will kill the king. And he ran to his aid. You know, the average Christian is a consumer. He wants to just come to church. And he wants a preacher that will just stand on the pulpit and say, take it. Come on, fly into it. Load it in your spirit. But he never, ever, ever thinks that it is a good thing to kneel down and say, Lord, watch over my pastor. Pastor is even too far. How many Christians even pray for their fathers who are the head of their home? Father, father, your father at home. How many Christians? How many? If, what's the name of this warrior now? Abishai. Abishai. The son of Zeruiah. If he was not such a man, not such a man, everybody would have been fighting their own battles, fighting their own battles, then they would just hear, hey! David has died. And you know, in ancient warfare, once you have killed the king, the battle has ended. The people will be forced to surrender. Their king has died. So those of us who watch epic movies, you will notice that. In the battle, you will hear them shouting, protect the king, protect the king. They guard the king jealously. Even those of us that play chess, the most important piece on the chess board is the king. The king is not even as powerful as the queen in terms of movement. But he's the most precious piece. Once your king is captured in chess, the chess game has ended. Checkmate. Wives don't even pray for their husbands. Everybody is under pressure. Under pressure. They need money. They want to eat. They need food. They need clothes. So nobody is sensitive in their priesthood enough to see that the head of their clan, the leader of their gang, the king of their lives is, on, is under attack. And once the king has been taken, you will become vulnerable. He says, strike the shepherd. And what will happen? The sheep will scatter. Will scatter. I don't know why the Lord is leading me like this. But you see, there, there is a, a urgent need. Urgent need. Because sometimes I stand and I look. There are certain preachers that I wonder, how did this man end up like this? How? There's a preacher. In fact, right now, many people will not know that those preachers influenced me as a Christian. Because I can't even call their name in public anymore. They are a disgrace, a disaster. A disaster. And these were men that I could call ranking apostles in the 2000s. I used to travel from Abraka to Sapele to go and buy their tapes. That was the only Christian bookshop around me that I could buy tapes. I used to travel. Even sometimes with my school fees, I had a workman, yellow earphones. I liked my earphones to be very, very beautiful. So if it's not yellow, it's red. It's, I used to workman. If I didn't read my books as much as I listened to messages, 
And I'm not recommending anything like that. I'm just telling you how afflicted I was in my soul to know God. But those men today, they are like a caricature. All kinds of scandals. All kinds of things around their lives. And I'm wondering, how did he get there? He went to war when his oil had finished. He was fainting. And the painful thing about the fact that he was fainting is that nobody noticed. There was no Abishai. Even in your daily life as a Christian, I say this thing all the time. Don't be the kind of Christian that does not have accountability horizontally and vertically. You must have brothers on your own level that you are not afraid or ashamed to tell that I'm beginning to think foolish things. So. Or even if you cannot tell them, they should be able to notice that something is wrong with you. And reach out to you and say, Angela, the way I saw you in, in service, that fragrance that is normally associated with your life, I didn't feel it. Are you still praying so? Somebody that you don't need to impress. You know, we are raising a generation that thinks spirituality is for impressing people. So we talk about prayer, talk about Bible study, as if we are trying to impress each other. What? Oh my God. In those days, some of my brothers are still alive that we, we did ministry together. Or we, we pursued God together. That's the right word. We pursued God together in university. They are still alive. We are like mad people. You go and visit one. He's telling you, I listened to this message. See the way I was. Then you grab the message. You go and sit somewhere and listen to it and catch fire. It was not competition. But now we are trying to impress people. So somebody's lamp is dry and empty. It's no longer burning. It's no longer shining. His influence cannot even be felt in his own life. Do you know that your priesthood is not just for others. It's for you. If your priesthood is not working, you will be suffering. You, you, you. Your, your, your fellowship with God will be suffering. You must have people in your life that you can be vulnerable with to say, Oh God, I'm dying. Oh, I'm dying. My son here, Monday, something happened. He came to me. He said, Daddy, even if I've already spoken to God about it, I need to tell you. It's accountability. I need to tell you. You are the ogre of yourself. There's nobody that is like Abishai that can see that you are dying. David would have died like a cockroach. It's not a thing of honor for your king to die in battle. You have died like a cockroach. And you know that the oil is simply a symbol of the Holy Ghost in the New Testament. When our worry, prayer and prophetic conference comes, you will, you, will, you will see how God will lead us. The theme for the worry, prayer and prophetic conference is the bread and the wine. And if you've read through scriptures, you will find out that that, that that enclave is not complete. Whenever the Bible speaks about bread and wine, it will speak about what? Oil. These were the three critical matters that were used to uphold the people in the, in the scriptures. If God even wanted to punish them, he would withhold their bread, he would withhold their wine, he would withhold their oil. These are all metaphors. So your priesthood must be such that your fires continue to burn. Continue to burn. And there is no flame without oil. None. You must have such intimate relations with the Holy Spirit that allow you to consistently function accurately in priesthood. Deep relations with the Holy Ghost. If not, you will be like David. In fact, Abishai had to tell him, 
you will not go to battle with us again. Do you know that this thing, this thing, this thing was an indictment upon David? Because with David's kind of work with the Lord, he should, he's supposed to have had the same testimony that Moses had. The Bible says that Moses' strength did not abate. Are you here? So even though Moses became very old, his strength was not affected by his progression in age. The Bible says even his eyes did not dim. But here is David. His strength had abated. In the things of the spirit, the older you get in God, the stronger you should be in the things of the spirit. The older. In God, not in age. In the natural, as you are getting older, eh, degradation will begin to set in with your body. So as people get older, it affects their eyes. They get older. I saw an old man some days ago and I began to beg God to help me in my own old age. He was completely bent over. This is how he's walking. Old, bent over. As you grow older in physical age, degradation occurs. But if you go older in God, eh? you go older in God, the stronger you should be with him. Stronger. That's why we say that things of the spirit is not about age. It's not about the number of years you have lived on the earth. It's in encounters. The more encounters you have with God, the more deep you should be in the knowledge of God. The more skilled you should be in the things of God, the more you spend time with God. So you will notice that in the case of Eli, even though physical age had affected his physical eyes, are you with me? The Bible says he could no longer see physically. Eh? But yet, he had been with God long enough to still school Samuel. Now when Samuel came to him and said, did you call me? He said, ah. He said, go back. It's like the Lord is trying to bring a message to you. Next time when you hear the voice, say, here I am. That's a man who has been with God long enough. So he was blind in his physical eyes and his spiritual condition was no longer the way it was supposed to be. Yet, he had something with God. He could still school a young prophet. I'm wondering tonight why the Lord is leading us like this. It means that there are people on site and online that their lamps are either about to go out or have gone out. God doesn't do things accidentally. God is not a God of happenstance. It's either your lamp is no longer burning. So God has made up his mind that you can no longer be on a, on a bush. He's looking for a place to put you because you can't bring influence anymore. What is the use of having a priest in a family and that priest cannot even bring the light of God to that family? So we need to put you on that bush. So in the temple, talking about the priest's consecration, in the temple, you will find out that there were two altars. If you are still with me, say amen. You will find out that there were two altars in the temple. And these are the matters I want to establish tonight to speak about first the tool, the tools, or the tool. If I can touch two, I'll touch two. If it's one, I can touch, I'll touch one because the time is almost gone. And then we can continue next week. But we will do this until August when we start our fast. Now, there's a tool required. There are tools required for the priest to be able to maintain his consecration. Because the priest is not permitted to engage in priesthood carelessly. Let me show you some scriptures. Let me show you one scripture. Give me Leviticus. Uh, 16. 
Leviticus 16, give me verse 2. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother, not to what? Come at just any time into the holy place, inside the veil, before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he what? Die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So God was saying to Moses, tell Aaron that in his priesthood, him as the priest is not permitted to approach anyhow. He's not permitted to just come anyhow he likes. That's not how it works. Go to the next verse. He now says, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. How shall he come? Number one. With the blood of a young bull as a what? And of a ram as a what? So the first place Aaron must get to in the function of his priesthood as a priest. These were articles of consecration for the priest. The first place he must get to is the altar of burnt offering. Are you with me? Because it is there, it's at the altar of burnt offering that he will bring a, he will get the blood of a young bull and he will make the sin offering and it's there that he will make the ram as a burnt offering. What was a burnt offering? A burnt offering was an offering that was offered completely to the Lord. Completely. So once the offering was brought, the priest, the person will kill the offering. Hmm. Somebody is saying, show us, show us. Okay. Burnt offering. Let me see. Leviticus 1. Give me verse 3. Leviticus 1 verse 3. Let me see. Aha. Uh -huh. If his offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting before the Lord. Next verse. Then he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. Verse 5. He shall kill the bull before the Lord and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of what? So that's how the burnt offering operated. Next verse, verse 6. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it out into pieces. I don't want to derail. But what happens is you bring the offering yourself. The one that was offering the burnt offering brought it to the priest at the outer court. And then the priest will take the burnt offering, skin it, clean it, put it on the altar, cut it to pieces, and it will be completely burnt to ashes. The entire burnt offering. But the blood that comes from the burnt offering, the blood that comes from the burnt offering, he must sprinkle it on the altar. Not just everywhere on the altar, on the horns of the altar. The brazen altar had four horns. That's the altar of burnt offering. He had four horns. Then the priest will sprinkle the blood on that altar. Then he will take of that blood and enter into where is called the holy place. Or what is we call the inner court. So the priest's first approach in his consecration is the altar of the burnt offering. And I don't have the time to take this further, but you will find out that when you read the book of Leviticus, it will tell you that that offering was an offering for acceptance. So when you gave a burnt offering, what you are doing is that you are asking the Lord to accept you so that you will be able to come into him, into his presence. But in the new covenant, we no longer need to do something to be accepted. What we need to do, let me not say we don't need to do something. You don't need to perform certain works like offering a sacrifice. What you need to do is you need to believe in Jesus. So you are now accepted in Christ. 
on the basis of the work that Christ has done, you can now engage in your priesthood because of the work of the high priest that is Christ. So what does the altar of the burnt offering represent? There's a reason it is called a brazen altar. Brazen there simply means bronze. What did I say it means? And if you know your metals in the Bible, there are three critical metals that are used in scripture, bronze, silver, and gold. And what does bronze stand for? Judgment. What did I say bronze stands for? Judgment. So the brazen altar, one, is a place of judgment. Two, is a place of what? Death. Because that's where the sacrifice must be killed. So if I have been made acceptable in Christ, why then are you still speaking about the brazen altar? In the priest's consecration, he must ensure that flesh is judged. He must ensure that his flesh is mortified. And what is flesh? Flesh is the Adamic nature. The nature of man that became corrupted by sin that Adam engaged in at the beginning. The Adamic nature. You cannot function accurately as a priest if your flesh is not crucified. This is why your first place of call before you go into the inner court, you must experience judgment and you must experience death. This judgment, because you are a believer, is not a judgment based on the wrath of God because you are in rebellion. It's a judgment on your Adamic nature. On your Adamic nature. It's a death of your carnal desires, the corruption that exists in your flesh. Otherwise, your flesh will become the gateway for Satan to turn you against God. Because as a priest, you engage God with your spirit. What your spirit is to God, that is what your flesh is to Satan. So while God deals with you on the basis of your spirit, empowers your spirit, educates your spirit, visits you, Satan takes advantage of your Adamic nature to seek to distract you, seek to oppress you, seek to turn you against God. This is why God says, before you enter into the inner court, go to the brazen altar judge the flesh so what is the tool that the priest employs to guarantee that this judgment and this death occurs is called fasting what did I call it fasting so what you do with fasting fasting is not for God fasting is for you it's just that once you have done that fast God sees your humility and then God finds pleasure why does he find pleasure? Because your flesh is judged and your Adamic nature dies. So you now become a sweet aroma to the Lord. God is pleased by the fragrance coming from your life. Those are the kind of priests that he invites into the Holy of Holies. Are you with me tonight? I know I'm putting many things together. You might need to listen to this message like two, three times again. To get the juice of what I'm teaching. Because the two altars are for incense. Are you here? There's an altar of incense in the inner court. I haven't gotten there yet. I'm still dealing with the brazen altar that is called the altar of the burnt offering. At the altar of the burnt offering, a sweet smelly savour comes from the offering. You remember Noah? When he came out of the ark, the Bible says... He built an altar. He offered clean animals. And the Lord, what? Smelt. His sweet server. It was that smell that came from that offering 
that provoked God to cut a covenant with man. So when the priest goes to the brazen altar and his flesh is judged and he dies to his Adamic nature and his spirit now becomes the facility that brings government to his operations in the visible realm. He's not run by his Adamic nature. A fragrance ascends to heaven. It's called a sweet smelly salve. It's that fragrance that God perceives that now brings him pleasure. And when fasting is effective, your Adamic nature should be damaged. Are you with me? Okay, let's put it in scripture. Kai, I may not be able to go far today. Isaiah 58, give me verse 1. Isaiah 58 verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a prophet, like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. What is their transgression? Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Do you understand this? He's saying, go and tell Israel their sins. Even though they are living in sin and they are, they are, they are, I'm angry with them, yet they still seek me daily. They still act like they delight to know my ways. They are living as if they did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They delight in approaching. They keep coming like they want to perform priestly functions. Verse 4, 3. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why is it that I'm humbling myself? I am at the brazen altar, but it looks as if God does not see. Why have we afflicted our souls? Fasting puts pressure. My father in the Lord defines fasting as starving your flesh and stuffing your spirit. It's not, it's not a pleasurable experience. Your, your, your soul will be afflicted. Your flesh will suffer. In fact, in the day of our fast, of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Verse 4. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the feast of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. So, so God is saying the essence of a fast is to make your voice heard where? And if your voice is going to be heard on high, there is a way to fast. There's a way to fast. He now begins to deal with it. Five. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Verse six. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy, heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Wait, don't read this thing quickly. Now, somebody might think, okay, so when I'm fasting, what God is saying is when I'm fasting, I should go and release the bonds of wickedness. I should go and remove heavy burdens from people that are carrying heavy burdens. I should go and uh, let the oppressed free. So if somebody is oppressed, I go and release the person from prison. Physical things. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the Adamic nature. For instance, to let the oppressed go free is to release yourself from the spirit of unforgiveness. unforgiveness because when you hold unforgiveness in your heart you are holding somebody in prison unforgiveness God is saying that how is it that you are fasting and you are still wicked do you know that there are some people who engage in spiritual disciplines they are still wicked the bonds of wickedness still consume their soul Your Adamic nature is still alive. And you claim to be fasting. That's not the fast I have chosen. Because somebody will say, eh, but God said it's not to cover yourself with ashes. I can show you three scriptures quickly now. Where the Bible says they fasted and God responded. 
and they did not do anything physical like this scripture is suggesting. So this scripture is using physical metaphors to describe Adamic natures that need to be, to be subjected to the altar if you want to approach. If your voice will be heard on high, you must go to the brazen altar in your priesthood. If you have not learned how to live a fasted life as a Christian, your priesthood will be weak. Very weak. Because the brazen altar, Jesus help me, the brazen altar is tied to the altar of incense. They are connected in the spirit. If you fail in one, you can't function in the other. You can't. So for instance, Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible tells us that Nehemiah took himself into a posture of mourning. Quickly, media help me. Nehemiah 1 and verse 4. He took himself into a posture of mourning. He says, so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for, for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He didn't go and release anybody from prison. God heard his prayer. Why? That fasting was effective because he did judgment and death to the Adamic nature. Give me Ezra 8.23. Ezra 8.23. Ezra 8.23. 8. So we fasted and entreated our God for this. And what happened? He answered our prayer. Give me Acts 13 from verse 1. Acts 13 from verse 1. Acts 13 from 1. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niga, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, who has been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, too. As they ministered to the Lord and what? Fasted. What happened? The Holy Spirit said, they didn't go and lose anybody from prison. They didn't go and remove burdens from people's shoulder. They didn't go and break any yoke. And you know, the metaphor for the yoke there, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with who? Unbelievers. Many of you are attempting to engage in priesthood and your relationships and your, your, your connections are so corrupted. You are so, so drawn to the world. The world still bears a connection to you and you want to engage in the Lord's priesthood. You cannot deliver a people from something you are still a slave of. If your priesthood is going to break the yoke of Satan, break the yoke of the world, break the yoke of the flesh, if you are still a slave, your priesthood will be impotent. Impotent. What are you yoked to? That's why Jesus said, if you come to him when you are weary and heavy laden, what he will do is that you will take his yoke. You must be yoked to Jesus. So the brazen altar is the place of death. And the savour that we come from the priest's life is a sweet smelly savour showing that the flesh has been judged. You can't be fasting and be wicked. You say you, you, you fast 40 days, you fast 30 days, and anger is, you are a slave of anger. Unforgiveness is still on your soul. Just two days ago, I didn't do anything to the brother. A colleague in the office went online, and there's nothing he didn't call me, including Yahoo Yahoo pastor. Insulted my wife. In fact, it's this morning, that I showed my wife the message. I opened our platform at work and I showed her. And she was like, what? What did you do to him? Nothing. Nothing. And then a part of me was saying, right to management. Let them punish him. Because if they see it, they will set up a panel. But you remember in those days, I don't know whether it is, what is this? Things fall apart. And some of you are too young. You didn't watch things fall apart. Hmm. In things fall apart, there's a phrase there. He says, he was speaking about one young boy. He said, do not have any part in his death. For the boy calls you father. And the Holy Ghost began to tell me, he said, what is coming for him is coming. Don't let them say your hand is inside. So I withdrew. Even though I was pained, you know what it means for them to call you Yahoo Yahoo? 
I was pained. Oh! My wife said, what did you do? I said, nothing, my love. I don't, I don't know. Why they, why, why they could they find my trouble like this? But you see, Jesus just wanted to guarantee that that part of my life has died. You know why I joined the confraternity? I hate, I hate oppression. I hate it. I can't stand. I saw them strip a boy in front of guest hostel. They told him to remove his shoe, remove his shirt, remove his trousers. Front of guest hostel. All his, all his, his big boy died in one day. And I said, it will never, ever happen to me. Those kind of things I can fight for people. I was in GT Bank and one man, one, one, one man was trying to park and a police officer armed to the teeth. Police armed. Began to oppress him. They didn't call me in the matter. I just turned. So why are you talking to him like that? I hate, I hate, I hate it. And in fact, the police said, you will not leave this place today. You will not do this. You do this. I said, hmm. I will drive here. Yeah. We enter my car and drive. Let me see what will happen. He said, you don't know us from Ekma. I will, fit, I will shoot all this your leg. I said, this leg is till I die. I die. So you can imagine the way I was feeling in my heart. Yet the one to whom I have offered myself as a sacrifice. He said, don't write, don't speak, don't talk. I just went to the platform and I wrote parables. I didn't address him there. There must be judgment for the flesh. It must die. Why? Because the Bible says we don't have the time, but write these scriptures down so you can study. I'll begin next week there. So you can study. It's already five past seven. We're behind time. Write Leviticus 6. Leviticus 6, read from verse 9 to 12. Leviticus 6, from verse 9 to 12. What you will find in Leviticus 6 is that Leviticus 6 will tell you that the fire on the altar, the brazen altar must be left perpetually what? Burning. Perpetually. Why does it need to be perpetually burning? Because if there is no fire at the brazen altar, there cannot be fire for incense at the incense, at the altar of incense. Because when you when you get to go and read Leviticus chapter 16 from verse 12, you will now see other things. And in, from that verse 12, you will now find out that for the priest to light up the altar of incense, he must come and take coals. Are you with me tonight? He will take coals from the brazen altar, carry it in his hand with the, with the incense. Then he will bring it to the altar of incense. And then it's those coals from the brazen altar that he will use to light the altar of incense. So if you have not judged the flesh, if there is no fire consistently on that altar, it's when I read this thing in this context, I now understood what Paul meant when he said, I die daily. I bring consistent death. Sister, you will just find out that when you begin to grow in priesthood, God will begin to tell you, you talk too much. The fires of the brazen altar are now beginning to walk. God is now getting ready to receive fragrance. It will be, God will begin to tell you, the Holy Ghost, the oil. Oh, me levate. I've run out of time. We begin to walk within, you, you, you talk too much, you talk too much. It's in those moments, the Holy Ghost will begin to walk upon you to tell you, listen, there's a way to live in this realm if you are going to survive. Unyoke yourself from anything that can bring corruption to your soul. Unyoke yourself. So if somebody can offend you, God will tell you to go and say sorry. Your lip will be shaking like this. But the sorry, because you know that you are coming back into the inner court. I will begin there next week. You are coming back into the inner court to do business. You cannot come there without the blood from the brazen altar. You can't come there. 
which coals? Where are you going to get the coals to light the altar of incense? That's why many are struggling with prayer. Because it's at the altar of incense you begin to activate the technology of consistent prayer. That's when the spices are now lit. And then your fire now begins to burn. If you've not been there, you will offer what the Bible calls what? Strange fire. Leviticus chapter 10. Go and read it when you get home. Why did God say that Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire? Notice what they did was to take fire and light their incense. God did not say they offered strange incense. <laughs> you are not seeing what I'm seeing. God did not say they offered strange incense. He said they offered what? Strange fire. Because the pattern is that it is coals from the burning brazen altar that you carry. But they, they brought fire from somewhere to light it. And God said, this is not the kind of... I want the fire from the place of death. That is the only fire that the oil is permitted to feed. So the oil of the Holy Ghost feeds that fire. Then when the oil of the Holy Ghost feeds that fire consistently, that's when the fragrance, the sweet fragrance of intercession now begins to make your voice heard in the high places of heaven. This is why even though we have many people that are praying, we don't have intercessors. Because intercession will cost you your very life. You will die at that altar. And I'm trying to remember the scripture, whether it's Exodus 30 now, is where God told us that he is the one that will come and light the fire. Do you know that that fire at the brazen altar, it was not lit by the priest. I will find that scripture for you next week. It was the Lord is a divine fire. That's what happens to you at salvation. Light me like menorah. Light fire in me. Have you heard that song before? Burn me like incense. Water your garden. Light me like menorah. Light fire in me. So God is the one that lights the, the fire at the brazen altar. So you will, you will present your body as a living sacrifice on the brazen altar. And then the Lord will light the fire. Once he lights that fire, you will now be dealing with your lust, dealing with your anger, dealing with your pride, dealing with your appetites, dealing with your unforgiveness, dealing with your overbloated sense of self-worth. You think you are better than everybody. You will he will be born in you. Now once, once that sweet savour begins to rise to heaven, then the priest can now carry the coals and go to the altar of incense. While the brazen altar is made of bronze, the altar of incense is made of gold. While the brazen altar speaks of death, the altar of incense speaks of life, speaking about the place of fellowship. Your, your spirit is now prepared. When you read Leviticus 6, you will now find out that God even says that the altar of incense is not in the holy place. It's in the holy of holies. It's then I began to understand. No wonder the altar of incense is just before the veil that leads into the holy of holies. Meaning that God considered that altar of incense part of the holy of holies. So your intercession only begins when you have fully come into his presence. So outer court, public life. Inner court, private life. Holy of holies, secret life. This is where you have secret things with the Lord. Two things tonight. Do you still have oil? Is that oil still able to feed the fire? Or you have begun to raise strange fire? Is it strange fire you are burning? Fire that comes from your flesh. From your desire to impress people. Tonight, ask him to light you like a menorah. Pray that prayer quickly. 
For me like Jesus. What are your garden? Light me like my Noah. From fire in me. Burn me like incense. What are your God? Light me like menorah. Fire. Burn me like incense. Burn me like incense. What are your God? Oh. fresh oil tonight fresh oil fresh oil may you not faint fresh oil fresh oil fresh oil fresh oil ulebera na kedio sinate debila mana teliata Kibeli berio sakadila na tiliato. I will not offer strange fire. No. I will not offer strange fire. Pray. I will not offer strange fire. Ile me kediana. Ile mano kebila no zini la belu Ule mere nelio sedila na kodila me desida yo. Ibele manamo telibario sedila na kedile telilo. Thank you. 
In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. I will encourage you to listen to this teaching again two, three times to draw the juice of what it is God was trying to say to us tonight.